So welcome to the workshop, a Not In My Name, a workshop for BIPOC survivors for prison abolition. We are proud to have Sajata Baliga, Alicia Sanchez Gill, and Amita Swadhin to actually share their bold moves to end sexual violence. I know our fabulous presenters would love to introduce themselves, so I will hand over the virtual mic to them. Next. Sujata, I believe it's you. Warm hellos, folks. Um, it's really, really good uh, to be with you. My name is Sujata Balaga. She, uh, her pronouns open to they, them. And um, I most recently was the director of the Restorative Justice Project at Impact Justice and, and recently left that job. Um, and now just have this title of Restorative Justice Practitioner. Um, and I'm spending some time writing and deepening my understanding of the things that I have been leaning into on the restorative justice front for the past few years, uh, past two decades, really, uh, previously a victim advocate and then became a public defender. So, um, and uh, come to you as a survivor today, as a survivor of color and um, learning to uh, grow my abolitionist politic uh, and um, my actions uh, in alignment thereof. So uh, thanks for, for having me and I will, um, not sure who's next, so I will. Yeah, Amita, passing it on to Amita. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amita Swadin. I use they and them pronouns. I identify as a non-binary femme person. Uh, I'm often cis-assumed, and we can have a conversation at some other time about what that means, but I'm actually a non-binary person. Uh, I live in Los Angeles County on Tongva land, where I lead the Mirror Memoirs Project, along with our new co-director, Jaden Fields, who comes from our core membership. And this is a project I founded uh, four years ago, uplifting the leadership, healing, and stories of queer and trans and uh, non-binary and intersex people of color who were raped or sexually assaulted as children. Um, and uh, just excited to be here with all of you and see some familiar faces in the chat. I'm going to pass it to Alicia. Hi, friends. Um, thank you, Sujata and Amita. What a gift to um, be here with my uh, survivor comrades. My name is Alicia Sanchez Gill. My pronouns are she and her. Um, and I'm a queer Afro Puerto Rican um, survivor of child sexual abuse. Um, family violence and sexual violence. Um, and I am coming to you from Piscataway land, also known as Chocolate City, also sometimes known as Washington, D.C. Um, and I'm currently the director of a small social justice fund called the Emergent Fund. Um, and on the side, do all of my uh, transformative justice work. I um, come to this work, like many of you, from my time at a local rape crisis center and then my local domestic violence shelter um, and then women's clinic um, and have worked um, with survivors at the margins, particularly those of us who are queer and trans, those of us who are immigrants and of color, those of us who are current and former sex workers. Um, and in my previous role as the interim executive director of Collective Action for Safe Spaces based here in DC. I help to support the creation and continue to help support the creation of a queer and trans-led, people of color-led, um, transformative justice incubator for survivors of sexual and domestic violence with the kind of explicit goal of meeting the express needs of survivors of color who want alternatives to policing um, in their search for accountability and justice. So really grateful to be here. Thanks. Uh, before we move into the next slide, um, I'm going to give uh, the um, interpreters a moment to catch up. Um, I um, would love for us to all actually just take a moment uh, to um, acknowledge the land that we're on. And I just put uh, in the chat uh, something that says, uh, to learn more about the history and present reality of the occupied indigenous land where you are, see this link. Um, and this is a wonderful link that can tell you about the land you're on. Um, and, um, you know, many of us um, have put in the chat, you know, sort of where it is uh, that they are and, and um, in the world, right? Um, but uh, it's also good, I think, for us to take a breath uh, together as we acknowledge uh, the cruel, unjust, and yet unresolved truth 
uh, that the land each of us is on um, for those who are in the United States at a minimum and most many, many other places in the world um, that um, that those of us who are not indigenous play a role in the continuation of that occupation and have a deep obligation to work towards justice for indigenous people on the soil that we live off of and on the lands we occupy. So um, if we could just take one moment to acknowledge that and I too um, here in the Bay Area live on Chichonio Ohlone land uh, that was not ceded um, and uh, was taken. So. Um, so that is an opportunity for people to learn and lean into uh, learning a bit more about where it is uh, that you are and, and what the his history and present reality of that is today. Um, Alicia, I will pass it back to you. Thank you, Kujata, and thank you for that moment of land honoring and acknowledgement and not just land, but people honoring and acknowledgement. So would love to see where y'all are um, in the chat box. Um, so if John, I think John's managing slides, thank you to the folks who are um, making all of the behind the scenes work happen in this space. Just a moment of gratitude to them. John, thank you. Um, so one of the first things that we'd love to hear folks do, um, and Amita, if you want to jump in, I'm not sure, we would love to just get an um, an idea of how folks are showing up in terms of racial or ethnic identity in this space. I think it would just help us have some clarity and you can choose more than one, um, of course, if necessary, um, which for many of us it is. So please, please add that in. This is really helpful. Yeah, and I can just quickly jump in here. Thanks, Alicia. Um, the reason that we are doing this poll is just to acknowledge that this workshop is a special session for the National Sexual Assault Conference. It is uh, specifically for people who self-identify as survivors of sexual violence and also people who are Black, Indigenous, or otherwise a person of color. So thank you for indulging us so that we can see um, just the spread of folks in the room. And I realized that I didn't name my own ethnic and racial background when I was introducing myself, so my apologies. I am uh, the child of immigrants from the Indian subcontinent, specifically with heritage in India and Pakistan. And so in this poll, I would identify as South Asian American. I'm going to mute myself just to give us a chance to look at the results coming in. Alisa, would you like to share the results? Happily, yeah. So um, for folks who may not be looking at the poll results, um, we've got about 51 out of 145 people who've replied who identify as Black. So that's about 35%, and that makes up the majority of this space. Um, we also have folks who identify as Indigenous at about 10%, um, folks who identify as Latinx at 31%. Um, it's also important to note that this might not add up to 100 because, of course, many folks can choose multiple um, identities. Um, we've got some folks who represent Arab American communities, Southeast Asian at about 3%, South Asian at 3%, and East Asian at 4%, and then folks who identify as you know, other, a combination, um, something not listed here in the expansiveness of our um, vision and idea of what race and um, ethnicity means, and that's at about 30%. Um, and so I see that folks are um, um, sharing what that means in the chat box. So, great. Thank you all. Thanks, Alicia, and I will jump in here. Um, I do want to just uh, reiterate, I, I was looking at the chat box. So this is really our intention was before the COVID pandemic, when we first presented this workshop topic, we were going to be in person. And so we were really hoping to create a sacred space uh, without 
white attendees of the National Sexual Assault Conference in the room. And obviously it feels a little different when it's virtual, but that is still our intention, that this can be a discussion space specifically for survivors of sexual violence who are Black, Indigenous, or other people of color. And so if that isn't you, we totally understand how that could have happened. Um, but we do ask on an honor system that you remove yourself from the webinar. We did have an overage of registrants, and we want to also just present Preserve our intention for the space, for this to be a space for survivors of color to talk about abolition and exploring abolition together. Alicia, I'm going to pass it back to you to talk about the question that's up on the poll now. Sure, sorry, I was muted. I was in deep agreement with you, Amita. So um, just as we're, you know, survivors ourselves talking about our relationship to the politic of prisons and prison abolition, we wanted to kind of gauge in the space where other folks are. We know that we're not all coming perhaps with the same analysis, with the same lived experiences, of course, um, and just want to get an idea of kind of who's in the virtual you know, we're not in person, but who's in the room um, for this conversation. And so what we're seeing based on the poll results so far um, in, in terms of answering the question, what's your relationship to the politic of prison and police abolition is I learned about abolition for the first time this year. And that's about 22% of folks who are in this space with us. Um, about 27% of folks said, I've known about abolition for a while, but I am uncertain whether I agree with it. And then we've got another 51% who say, yep, I'm all in, definitely an abolitionist. So thank y'all for indulging um, in that question with us. Amita, thank you, yeah. to, to say more. Thank you. I'm just going to do some light housekeeping. Obviously, again, in a virtual space, there's not too much that we have to talk about, but I'm going to put in the chat some suggested agreements uh, for how we intend to run the space, and I'll read them out loud. So our requested agreements are, number one, that if you're speaking in the chat, that you use I statements. We definitely welcome a lot of discussion in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, given the limitations of us having 200 people in the room, in the virtual room, we aren't going to be able to get into a dialogue uh, with you unmiked and with being able to see each of you. But we do want you to speak to each other and speak to us, but please speak from your own experience. Mm -hmm. The second agreement that we are requesting, oh, we're getting some feedback if someone is unmuted. Um, the second agreement that we are requesting is to please remember that the chat is being recorded. Um, that's just for your own well-being. Um, just know that whatever you share there will come up in the transcription for this recording. Um, so that doesn't mean it will be publicly shared, but again, the staff of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault will see it. Um, and the third, and this is what feels incredibly important to me, um, is that again, we know that by you being here, welcome, hello, thank you for coming. Uh, we know that you are a survivor of sexual violence and that you are a black indigenous or person of color identified individual. Please do feel free to name at any point, if it feels relevant, the age or ages at which you experienced sexual violence and the role in your life of the person who harmed you, uh, the role that they played. For example, were they a parent, a sibling, a neighbor, a teacher. We're not asking for that experience now, but just as we are talking, if it feels important for you to share, please feel free. Um, but we ask that you please do not share details beyond that, as we don't want folks in this space to be triggered by the details of our own narratives. And we, me, Sujata, and Alicia as the presenters will also not be sharing uh, details of the, the way that the violence happened in our lives, what were the acts of sexual violence that we were forced to endure. Um, and that's because we can't be together in circle. Uh, normally we would have healers in the room, we would have therapists in the room, and we can't do that over Zoom. So I just wanted to ask that those agreements were okay. And I see some of you sharing uh, already the age at which you were harmed and who the people who harmed you were. So thank you for being brave and vulnerable in that way. I'm also going to ask in the chat uh, if you could just show if these agreements are okay with you. You can either put a thumbs up on your Zoom window or put a yes in the chat box. Thank you for, for doing that. 
And I'm just going to pause so that we can do that and that we're bearing witness to each other's survivorship as folks are continuing to share. Thank you. Um, I'm going to also just name some of the personal positions that I hold, and I know um, Alicia and Sujata are going to share more about themselves, but the reason that we wanted to do this workshop at the National Sexual Assault Conference was because there's been a lot of dialogue in the media and in our movements, and I use movements with an S at the end, um, to end sexual violence, about the role that survivors have to play in this collective work, collective effort to end rape culture and end sexual violence. And I think for me, it is very important that survivors be leading this work, but it's not enough for me that survivors um, feel qualified to lead social justice work just by nature of our survivorship. I think what's also very important for me is that our, our politic and our strategy and our commitments be aligned with an intersectional analysis and a commitment to look at the role of institutions, the role of the state in causing sexual violence and in creating further divisions in our society that feed into rape culture. So that was the reason that we wanted to bring you all together. And before I pass it to Alicia to tell us a little bit about the history of abolition as it it intersects with the movement to end sexual violence or movements to end sexual violence, I wanna just take a moment to breathe all of us together. I learned this very easy, very simple, very Zoom friendly breathing technique from my partner in life. His name is Patricio Manuel. And he happens to be a professional boxer and also a trauma-informed somatic healer. And you can do this anytime. Um, the technique is literally to breathe in twice via your nose and then out through your mouth. And we're gonna do that together three times. And I will model for you once so that it goes like this. So I invite you wherever you are to feel your feet on the floor or your back against the chair if you're sitting down or your whole body against the bed if you're lying down, whatever makes you feel comfortable. And we're gonna do three rounds of that breath. So here we go, two inhales. And then exhale. One more time. And one final time. And I invite you to take that technique on with you, use it throughout this workshop and throughout the conference. Anytime you just need to be in your body a little bit more than a Zoom screen allows you to be. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Alicia. Thank you, friend. Thanks, Amita. That breathing was actually both um, Sujata and Amita's breathing was helpful for me too. Um, let's not, uh, I'm just deeply reminded of our, all of our humanity in this, these incredibly hard times between um, fighting for some of us for like our literal lives and um, also being in the middle of a pandemic. So um, thank you for that reminder to be connected to our breath. Um, yeah, so I wanna talk a little bit about the carceral system. You know, we're here to talk about our own survivorhood and our relationship to abolition, but I think it's really important um, to kind of define terms. And um, I hope that, you know, as I'm talking about carcerality um, and abolition, that it also, that you are also talking back um, in the chat box um, talking to each other and talking to me. I also, as I'm watching the chat and seeing people name their experiences of um, 
of violence. I just want to take a moment of like deep breath and reflection and honoring um, all of you for sharing and for your um, lived experience. I'm just really grateful to be sharing this space with my um, comrades. So, um, so let's talk about <laughs> what is the carceral system. You're going to hear us pop probably talk about this a lot in this conversation. So, um, it makes sense to define some of these some of these concepts and terms. Um, and what I'll say is that in my own work as a social worker who started out in um, direct service practices um, and then kind of moved into more policy work um, and as a survivor myself who's engaged in healing and providing supportive services in community with sur other survivors of violence and then later as a researcher and policy analyst um, I really became very interested in the carceral system we'll talk a little bit more um, later on about our own experiences and how we came to abolition but I want to share a couple of definitions with you all. So first, the formal um, definition perhaps of the carceral system is that it's the law enforcement officers um, who police the streets, uh, it's the court marshals, it's the lawyers, it's the probation and the parole officers, of course it's the correctional officers. So really it's all of the formalized institutions that we would call the criminal justice or criminal legal system. Um, but I like to think of um, the carceral state or the carceral system as a much wider, much more um, expansive net of all of the ways that marginalized communities are monitored or surveilled. And I mean that from um, the monitoring and surveillance of Muslim folks in this country and Arab American folks in this country to ICE and detention to the war on drugs. Um, so criminalization and racial profiling really shape and influence, of course, how police, how immigration officers, how school officials, and how social workers impact with people of color. They, they fuel um, a heightened sense of surveillance and monitoring and punishment um, in our communities, and often with negative consequences for those of us who experience the targeting. Um, this kind of manifestation at the systemic level, I really think of is at the heart of many of the most disturbing and in some cases deadly incidents of violence and, and murder that we see in school, in immigration, and in law enforcement settings. Women of color, folks of color, LGBTQ folks of color, and particularly those of us who are Black and Indigenous, have a long history of entanglement with social services and social systems um, that are often seen as um, neutral, right? But are, are are not neutral. And so I think about organizations and agencies such as Child Protective Services. Um, so many of the survivors that we are and the survivors that we're working with are bringing historically founded fears of children being taken away when engaging with court systems where protection orders are filed, stigma from social workers when accessing psychosocial supports to heal from violence, sorry if you hear that helicopter, um, or concerns about deportation when it attempting to access services. All of these actors, from the correction officers to social workers, actually help to buffer the carceral state. Next slide, please. So we're going to go on a little history lesson. Um, so what is abolition? Um, so the, pol the police and prison abolition movement is a political movement largely based in the United States, but certainly um, in other places as well in different iterations. Um, that advocates for replacing policing with other systems of public safety, like housing, for example. It calls for an end to all state institutions um, that I've already named, everything from abolishing ICE to abolishing prisons. Um, I think it's really important to name that policing is a direct outgrowth of slave patrols. Um, and prisons are in a direct lineage of the enslavement of some of our ancestors. Um, prisons are a direct outgrowth of the horror of slavery. So when we talk about, for example, the 13th Amendment, which is credited with ending slavery, it actually stopped short of that. It made, us, it made an exception for folks who were convicted of crime. And this is how we see that from Black codes right after slavery, um, which were laws that governed, surveilled, and restricted the movement of Black folks to Jim Crow laws, right? The criminal justice system or the criminal legal system has become a new way to control the movement, the experiences, the, the where we live, all of those things for Black folks. 
Um, it's also important to note that the U.S. has the highest rate of incarceration of any nation on Earth. We represent 4% of the world, the planet's population, but we um, imprison 22% of um, the world's population. Um, and then, you know, just from the 1970s through today, the, the rate of incarceration has quadrupled, even probably more than that. It's gone from like 300,000 people in the US in prison to 2.2 million people in prison with 4.5 million on probation or parole. And black folks, as you know, are incarcerated at rates that are five times the rates of whites and white folks, um, and at least 10 times the rate in many states. Um, and so the primary, premise of policing and of abolition itself is that the system of policing cannot be reformed, cannot be fixed, because it is doing exactly what it was intended to do, which is to be punitive and to punish Black folks, um, and by proxy all other folks of color. Um, and I think that this is one of those moments where it becomes really important to be clear when I say Black folks, I don't mean people of color. I mean, specific, there are some specific ways that anti-Blackness and a legacy of enslavement have shown up um, and harmed Black people in this country. Um, so I'll ask you to go to the next slide. Um, you might need to click it more than once. Sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah, so here's the, so here's some fun history um, because what we really want to see as a result of um, divesting um, and defunding police and investing in our, our communities and ourselves and our safety and our wellness is a reallocation of resources. But I want to talk about how the anti-violence field became so entangled with the police to begin with. Was it always like this? Um, is policing preventable? Um, is it inevitable? Or is it used to prevent, reduce, or end sexual, sexual violence? Um, so just roll with me for this quick history lesson. So the gender-based violence field actually began, as many of us know, um, as interpersonal advocacy in the form of informal networks of support, right? So survivors were supporting other survivors. Many of our rape crisis centers, um, domestic violence shelters started in the homes of um, survivors themselves, started in church based started as mutual aid projects and family caregiving. We've been long connecting with one another. I think that survivors have been connecting with each other for as long as surviving has existed. Um, many of the projects and like peer advocacy that we see now as standard in our field um, started as informal, um, as survivor-centered and survivor-led. survivor, survivor -led. It was deeply self-advocacy that kept survivors connected to each other and able to build relationships. And these things were hyper-local um, and culturally specific, right, when they started. Um, but what we saw is that, particularly in the early 70s, as more and more survivors began to seek supportive services from networks, organizations, and collectives, they had to expand to really meet the growing need of services. And it wasn't because the rates of violence had necessarily increased in our communities. It was because people were becoming more politicized. We were developing language. We were, we were creating campaigns. We were um, launching protests and movements and marches. We were doing Take Back the Night, right? And so all of these things really politicized survivors about their own um, lived experience. Um, but concurrently, these folks were working to kind of shift patriarchy and all of its forms in the public sphere. And what, what, what it ended up happening is that these interventions, as they were community-based and hyper-local, advocates began to petition their local governments, their state governments, for changes to legislation that would protect survivors. Um, things like crime victims' compensation, for example, or, or resources for a safe shelter. Um, they understood soon, pretty quickly, right, that legislation, as we know, um, can vary from state to state. Um, confusing survivors and sometimes allowing folks who have done harm to evade accountability by simply crossing state lines. 
Um, so in more progressive states, laws were quickly being passed to protect survivors, but in other communities, survivors had a harder time accessing services or finding safety. So then laws around sexual assault and domestic violence were inconsistent, statutory rape laws varied, and in many communities, marital rape laws were non-existent. And so in order for a large widespread movement to end sexual assault, survivors understood that they then needed to engage in federal legislative advocacy. So in response to that, the first federal legislation on interpersonal violence was passed in 1984, and that was FIPSA or the family, that's not like a forgiving um, acronym, FIPSA, the Family Violence Prevention Act was passed, um, which became the first federal funding in 1984 specifically dedicated to emergency shelters and supportive services for survivors of domestic violence and their children. Though it was originally focused on intimate partner violence in subsequent reauthorizations, it was expanded to include teen dating violence um, and then kind of interacts with other federal legislation like um, the Child Abuse and Prevention Treatment Act, the Violence Against Women Act, and the Elder Justice Act. A decade later, um, in 1994, what we would call landmark legislation, the Violence Against Women Act, or VAWA, would pass. And it was considered a victory pretty overwhelmingly for um, the Violence Against Women movement, um, which it was called at the time. They coordinated criminal justice responses with social services and federal funding and really acknowledged that interpersonal violence was a public health issue. Um, however, I think it's really important to note that VAWA was not standalone um, legislation. We often think of it as a beacon for um, survivors of sexual violence, but VAWA was actually rolled into a larger suite of crime bills called the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, which is more commonly known as the Crime Bill, which is a bill that was understood to really expand militaristic policing mass incarceration and punitive responses to um, gender-based violence. And so we're seeing like a tension between the need for survivors to have funding, housing, and supportive services, and yet a more deep entrenchment of the criminal legal system and of policing. Um, and really what happened was organizations deepened their engagement with the police and criminal legal systems, expanded their engagement with child protective services and family service agencies, and then kind of increased the professionalization of the work and moved away from survivor-led um, survivor models and really were complicit in um, expanding the carceral state in many ways. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and so survivors of color in these spaces are really navigating just a complex web of um, social inequity. Oh, thank you, Kita. <laughs> um, I don't know how many minutes ago that was, but um, are navigating a complex web of social inequality that are stemming from long-standing laws and policies often guided by really biased research. And so from this nation's early history of colonization and enslavement and unethical medical experimentation on Black bodies to today's the criminalization of sex work, um, which allows for racialized and gendered policing um, and police profiling and abuse of transgender and cisgender women of color to the sexual assault of children in ICE detention, the roots of personal and state violence against marginalized bodies are well formed. And so what I'm saying is that women of color and our children and folks of color, those of us who are queer and trans and non-binary, we experience violence at the hands of our partners and our families, but also at the hands of the state simultaneously. Um, just last week, we saw that Jacob Blake's children were in the car when he was shot. We saw that Corinne Gaines was holding her son in her arms when she was shot by the police. When Charlena Lyles called the police um, for a domestic violence call, she had her children in the home when she was murdered by the police. And if we care about children of color and survivors, what I am saying then is that our reliance on the carceral state is actually killing us. 
Um, and so the unintended consequences of past domestic violence and sexual assault laws have often disproportionately harmed and impacted women and girls of color, leading to increased policing um, in our communities, mandatory arrest, no drop rules, escalation of violence, and often excessive force by police officers and other first responders to domestic violence calls. Next slide. Yeah. So we won't end the end patriarchal violence. We won't end sexual assault if we don't end the carceral state. Divestment from the state is a mandate, in my opinion, um, for survivor safety. I just want to be clear that policing was not always the standard for our safety, and I don't think that it's an inevitability. Um, state violence should not be and is not going to be <laughs> a necessary byproduct of keeping um, survivors safe. And I think that part of how we reclaim, renew, and restore the dignity of survivors is by honoring and working towards a world that's both free from state State violence and interpersonal violence. So I'll stop there. Um, please feel free to um, offer feedback in the chat. And I think that I'm turning it over to Sujata. Thank you so much for that wonderful framing and for giving us uh, the beginnings of understanding, you know, where where we have come from uh, to this moment. Um, and actually, Alicia, I believe um, that uh, well, I will I will just do this and say that this is the um, part where we're each going to answer some questions, the three of us. Um, and Alicia, I believe, oh no, I'm sorry, it is Amita who is going first. Um, and so um, the the first question uh, that I'd like for each of us to answer is um, sharing a bit about how it is that we personally came to abolition. So. Um, so, Amita, if you don't mind uh, jumping in and just giving us about five minutes of your thinking on how it is that you came to abolition. Thank you, Sajatha, and thank you, Alicia, for that overview. I feel like even though I know some of that history, I learned in listening to you. So I really appreciate your framing and uh, sharing your slides with us. Um, so for me, and I, I really want to honor before I dive into a little bit of my journey, um, how many of you in the chat decided to share um, a little bit about your survivorship. I read many, many, many um, disclosures of the ages at which you were harmed and the people who harmed you. And that is always sacred sharing. I'm learning how to share space over Zoom with other survivors. And I just really want to thank you and to know that we are bearing witness to you, um, albeit in this new technological format. So uh, in the chat, I had shared that the person who harmed me uh, was my father from the ages of four to 12. And that harm included many different forms of sexual violence, including rape um, on a pretty regular basis. And I happened to be wired. Uh, I don't think when, when sexual violence happens to us that early that we choose our coping mechanisms. I think that some of us are wired um, to lean into things like being praised and seeking affirmation um, in ways that are socially acceptable. And other people, like my own siblings, uh, sometimes rebel. And all of it is OK. I don't think there's any such thing as a bad survivor or a good survivor in reality. And I do think that our, our industry of um, anti-sexual violence organizations unfortunately does create that. So I'll just share that to start. I was someone who got labeled a good survivor because my coping mechanism at the tender, very, very, very tiny age of four um, was to overperform in schools. And I ended up skipping kindergarten, I had all white teachers. I never had a teacher of color in my entire K through 12 education. And um, because I think largely because I am a light skinned um, child of immigrants from India specifically, um, that I was seen as uh, acceptable when I spoke up and took up a lot of space in the classroom, right? That behavior was affirmed and rewarded. And, um, and so, you know, I really believed in the state as a child. Uh, and I want to be clear about that. I think that there's been a lot written and talked about this year about propaganda 
um, which is a term that I had not heard before this year, and I really appreciate that term, right? The way that as children, we are brainwashed by the state um, to believe that the police are here to protect us if we are not black um, or we are not indigenous. And for myself, as a child of immigrants, non-white immigrants, right, it was a very mixed message. My father taught us that we were not to trust the authorities. He himself was not a citizen for most of my childhood, so there was some fear of his um, deportation if he had been caught and um, punished by the carceral system. Um, and I, I knew that to some extent without ever having an explicit conversation with him about it. Um, but in school, right, it was programs, I'm a child, I'm 42, so I'm a child of 1980s and early 90s programs like D.A.R.E. to keep kids off drugs. Um, and, you know, the, the cops were people who were not directly harming me. The person who harmed me the most was my own father. And at, as a child, I really was hungry for anyone to step in and save me. Um, and no one ever did. The cops didn't, the teachers didn't. Um, a next door neighbor tried to intervene uh, at some point, um, and she was an older black woman who lived with her adult daughter. And that was the only level of really what I would consider transformative justice intervention that I got from an adult. Um, she would come downstairs in our apartment building where we lived until I was eight and bring my sister and I, my sister is four years younger than I, um, she would bring us gifts for Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day, even though neither of us were Irish, and Easter and Halloween and any excuse that she could make up to come and knock on our door and talk directly to me and my sister and just check in with us. Um, but I, I believed that police were sort of a neutral ground. And, uh, you know, actually they did um, intervene in my family's life in a couple different ways. And this is the beginning of my journey as an abolitionist. So when I was 13, I disclosed the sexual violence that had happened to my mother. Um, I didn't do it to save myself. I did it to prevent, hopefully, that violence from happening to my sister. And my mother, uh, who had taken no action, uh, my mother, I have to say, on her behalf was um, raped and sexually assaulted and battered in many ways by my father throughout their 16-year marriage. Um, and she didn't do anything to protect me. But when I finally disclosed to her when I was 13 in order to protect my sister, she called a therapist. And she didn't know what mandated reporting was. And I didn't know what mandated reporting was. And this was 1991, before the Violence Against Women Act, which as very problematic and carceral as that act was, unfortunately, it's the only, um, the only legislation that even allowed us to have conversations that were attempting to be survivor-centered with the people who had authority over our lives, like therapists, like prosecutors, right? Um, and so I think that the response of the state was incredibly racist. They told me that they knew that sexual violence happened more in my community and my culture, um, child sexual abuse specifically, and that I could trust them. Um, and then the police and the prosecutors threatened to prosecute my mom for being what they called, and this is an exact quote, for being complicit in the violence that had occurred um, in my life. And obviously that did not feel like a, a real solution for me who had watched my mother be brutalized by my father for my entire childhood. So I didn't cooperate with the prosecution. My father was not incarcerated um, and he continued to stalk and harass us during the entire time that my mother was trying to leave that marriage while I was in high school. And then the final thing I'll say in my personal journey toward abolition is I was uh, ordered into group therapy by the state my senior year of high school. And uh, it was group therapy for female assigned children, girls um, who had survived child sexual assault and had had state intervention. And the youngest girl in our therapy group who was Indo-Guyanese um, ended up being institutionalized in the county psychiatric institution 
because of suicidal ideation. And she was harmed again by the staff of that psychiatric institution and ended up taking her own life at the age of 13. So my own analysis of the carceral system also includes state-run psychiatric institutions, which have very much been a source of harm. She was a ward of the state. She was a foster care child. And for children who are uh, people of color and often uh, just completely being uh, cared for in quotation marks by the state, uh, their lives are very much endangered at every site of a state-run institution, including psychiatric institutions. Um, so that's, that's what I want to share about my personal journey. It deepened in working with children of color when I was a youth organizer beginning at the age of 22 because I worked in New York City public high schools that were heavily criminalized, heavily policed. We had armed police officers in our school. We had a lot of youth coming back to school after serving time in Rikers Island. This was in New York City. Um, and people who had been sexually assaulted and otherwise brutalized by the police. Many, many children who had had family members murdered by the police and otherwise brutalized by the police. So slowly in community uh, with about 5,000 young people over a decade in Brooklyn public high schools, uh, mostly who were Black American, Afro-Caribbean um, children, I learned the politic of abolition um, further through, through them and through hearing their stories and trying to be an accomplice to their healing and their power. Um, so thank you for that time. I'm going to pass it to Alicia, who is next. Thank you for sharing your story, Amita. And I'm also kind of in and out of watching the chat. So um, thank you all for continuing to engage with each other and with us. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about how I came to abolition, Amita, your story so deeply resonate. I mean, we talk about this all the time. So what y'all should know is that we are like dear friends. <laughs> um, but I just want to share again in a public space how, um, how impacted I always am by you sharing your story. So thank you, Amita. Um, so my story starts at about the age of seven, um, when my half brother moved into our home. Um, from juvenile detention. Um, and so um, my story begins with um, the criminalization of Black folks. Um, and so early on in my own experience of experiencing um, sexual violence by my half brother the fir at first um, was a lot of clarity around the fact that the state didn't keep us safe. And I think that that was influenced by a number of things. I think that it was influenced by the fact that we were Black, um, that I came from a mixed status um, household in terms of um, citizenship. Um, and so there were already fears around um, deportation. There were fears around um, policing, right? These are the times of, I don't, I don't remember exactly when Rodney King happened, but essentially, right, there was, there was already incidents of police brutality that were um, publicly, that we were publicly sharing and experiencing as a, as a country. Um, so I was really clear pretty early on that it wasn't safe to tell teachers, it wasn't safe to tell the police, I was really afraid. Um, also a tactic, of course, of child sexual abuse is um, making survivors feel guilt and shame and being afraid of, um, of coming forward, right, because of our own, because of being blamed. And so there were a lot of reasons that um, I never told um, and certainly never told the police, but I think that there was a lot of clarity, even at a very young age, even if I couldn't articulate the language of abolition, I was pretty clear that the police were not going to keep us safe, even though I also went to those D.A.R.E. programs and I'm pretty sure I still have a shirt um, that says D.A.R.E. on it. Um, and, you know, the other, the other thing that really politicized me around um, my experience of abolition is when I started working my first job out of college was at my local rape crisis center, um, shout out to the DC Rape Crisis Center, and um, was working with survivors. And the first thing that I found was that I, um, I managed our hotline and our 24 hour citywide sexual assault um, hospital advocacy program at the time, right out of college. And the first thing that I found was that almost every call that I got um, to our hotline was from survivors of child sexual abuse. 
um, so many of the folks that we were talking to um, may have experienced um, sexual violence in their adulthood, but almost all of them wanted to talk about their experiences of child sexual abuse. Um, and then the second thing that I found really commonly was that people were afraid um, to engage with the police. Most of the folks who were calling the hotline, even most of the folks who were coming to the hospital um, for services after a recent sexual assault, many of them did not want to come to the police. Some of them felt forced to come um, and engage with the SANE nurse program because of the fact that um, that was the only way at the time for them to get crime victims compensation or access to those kinds of financial services. Um, they may have needed a police report in order um, to have a stay away, a protection order, or in order to justify missing work. Like the, the responses to sexual violence are so incredibly punitive. Um, they may have needed uh, medical services and didn't have another way to access those kinds of services through like private health care. And so the only way to get prophylaxis or the morning after pill might have been to go through the same exam. And so those were some really important things that politicized me that people actually wanted other options um, for, in, for dealing with their own sexual violence and for holding the folks who did them um, harm accountable. Um, but there were no other options at the time um, that could get people the safety that they needed, the access to resources that they needed, and also not have to engage with the police. And so I think based on on working with and supporting hundreds of survivors and also my own experience with the carceral state um, and um, the criminalization of my own family and my own experience um, also I mean, the being um, kind of forcefully um, engaged in um, counseling as a child of color um, and survivor. Um, my experience is that has been that all of these institutions really harm and criminalize our communities, which really led me to a place of seeking for solutions that support survivors and keep us safe and allow us to heal outside of, um, outside of the carceral state and the criminal legal system. So thank you. Thanks for holding that, y'all. And I'll pass it to Sujata. Thank you so much to both of you. I'm just really uh, deeply grateful for this opportunity <clears throat> uh, to, to center our survivor stories uh, in the abolition journey. Um, and really the title of this uh, whole workshop, Not In My Name, uh, really just resonates so deeply with me. Um, and I just feel really grateful for kindred spirits. Um, likewise, um, just to, to be in community with those who uh, have walked similar journeys to my own. Um, and uh, just to know that we're not alone in um, the way in which the system as it currently operates disturbed us. Uh, so, you know, I think that there was something about some wake up aha moment when I was a victim advocate uh, in my early 20s, or right after law school, um, asking people, um, encouraging people, supporting people to do things that as a child, I myself didn't want or do, right? I never told anyone um, what was happening in our home. I had uh, no interest in my father being locked up, immigration consequences, uh, potential engagement of uh, child uh, protective services being placed in a family um, that didn't share my cultural background uh, in a very um, politically and socially conservative part of rural Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, I often say that the very systems that are in theory designed to help survivors are what ensured my silence, right? So, um, you know, and as I started to question these things, uh, I was, I felt very unwelcomed in movement spaces and organizations um, when I questioned alignment with the state. Um, and sadly, uh, I was pathologized uh, by um, more traditional uh, domestic violence and sexual violence organizations, people within them, um, and that it was sort of claimed that my own unresolved trauma, abuse trauma, uh, left me confused um, about what, in my experience, white women and others in power deemed to be sort of the correct answer uh, about what was needed in order to end sexual violence. Um, 
And I think, you know, I, I, obviously I was being gaslit and I, I, I really feel sad that at that time in my life, I didn't know about the growing insight women of color work and, and other things. And that I was just continually sort of beating my head against a, the wall of, of the traditional um, victim advocacy spaces. Um, but it was during some time when I was working in relationship with, um, of all things, um, uh, the, um, the, with NYPD, uh, that I was um, trying to help understand from the victim advocate perspective whether or not uh, the new mandatory arrest policies, and this is in the early 1990s, um, were being applied um, to protect women of color, particularly Black women. And in getting our first set of data back, what I saw was that the highest uptick in arrest data was actually of Black women. And um, that was a huge wake up for me. Like this is something that um, is being asked for and it is literally criminalizing black women. So, um, so you know, I, eventually uh, I, I felt incredibly grateful and I went to law school thinking uh, that I would be a prosecutor when I applied. Um, again, sort of in my early twenties thinking I'll be a good prosecutor. I won't be a racist prosecutor. And um, it, you know, it was, um, uh, on my very first day of law school and starting to read case law and understanding that the entire system was inherently flawed and wanting to drop out of law school during my first week of law school being like, there's literally no way. Um, reading the text of the 13th Amendment and seeing that it explicitly excluded um, uh, people who had committed crimes or, or even it was just, uh, to my mind, um, deeply, deeply flawed uh, on paper. Uh, it, the, the system itself was flawed. I had no idea how to move forward. And um, I was wisely advised um, to um, become a public defender. <laughs> and originally, I think I had thought that this would mean somehow that I would get to specialize in defending survivors, um, because I knew that survivors were criminalized, right, at this point. But that's not really, or, and especially back then, wasn't really a job. And so I ended up just becoming a public defender. And what I learned during those years really were that all my clients um, were CSA survivors uh, or survivors of other kinds of sexual harm or witnessed, and I think of them also as siblings witnessing other siblings being sexually violated in their own bedrooms. Uh, it just uh, horror stories um, after horror story of the, the histories of, of the people that I was representing. Um, and I also learned during that time really in developing deep relationships with the people that I represented uh, that uh, prison simply relocate sexual violence to inside um, state operated cages. And so, um, you know, what I really learned was that um, the, the criminal legal system hadn't benefited uh, me as a survivor in the multiple, multiple sexual harms that I've experienced in my life each and every time uh, I have been disserved by the system, whether uh, in the one, one situation in which I chose to engage uh, with the state uh, and the many other times when I have not um, deeply disserved by the system. Um, and that, that this is data, you know, this is information uh, that I wanted to um, to to have be honored, right? And that that there is a space within abolition to hold uh, these two truths. Um, um, and then um, I would just say that, you know, having the opportunity to work with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women really gave me space. Uh, Sue Ostoff, who, who runs that organization, really gave me space to start to deeply grapple with these things. Um, and then I started also, due to my dear friend Susan Marcus, going to restorative justice trainings um, where I got to start to imagine a world uh, that would have been what my family needed, where things would have been on offer that my family needed. So that's, you know, the overall picture, I think. Um, and now I think I will move us to the next question. Um, and Amita, I would ask you to answer it, which is um, how we live and work our abolitionist politic today. So Amita, if I could ask you to come back and... Here I am. <laughs> thank you, Sajatha, and thank you for sharing your story as well. Um, so I will keep this brief because we are trying to preserve some Q&A time with you. And I just want to say if you have, some of you have already been raising questions in the chat, please feel free to keep raising them because we are looking at the chat as well. Um, so my own 
current work around abolition, it's hard to talk about it without talking about 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was a graduate school student getting a master's in public administration and public policy in New York City. And I thought I was just going to do systemic change work from that position around child sexual abuse. And what I realized is that lawmakers, of course, are just human beings. And if you don't have a mechanism for which, by which uh, survivors of childhood sexual assaults can tell our stories in a collective way, in a way that engages the history of this country and of colonization and imperialism around the world, um, and that really looks at systemic harm and institutional harm, not just these individual either um, pedestalized stories uh, or um, stories of survivors who were taught we should pity, right? I feel like the survivor narrative when it's told in an individual sense goes one of those two ways. Um, we lose the fact that we are all living within rape culture, right? And so uh, oddly, I realized, you know, stories are the key to work that is actually going to get at the root causes. And because we don't have a culture in which survivors have specific specifically survivors of childhood sexual assault um, even in this era in which there's social media viral campaigns around sexual violence we still don't really talk or center children in that narrative um, even though the CDC CDC statistic is one in four female assigned children and one in six male assigned children will be raped or sexually assaulted by the age of 18. And we also know uh, from the American Academy of Pediatrics that gender nonconformity in childhood is a risk factor for child sexual abuse. And I was a very visibly gender nonconforming child. Um, I sometimes am visibly gender nonconforming as an adult, but as a child, I went to a boy's barber shop. I shopped equally in the boys department and the girls department for clothes. I really preferred overalls and turtlenecks um, to dresses. My mom had to fight with me to get me in dresses. I hated dolls. I liked cars, racing cars like Hot Wheels. Um, and gender nonconformity was a big way that I was targeted by my father. And I realized in putting together a play called Secret Survivors with an off-off Broadway company in New York City called Ping Chong and Company, and I'll put that in the chat for our interpreters. Um, 10 years ago when I was in graduate school, they had a model in which they brought survivors together or they brought people together whose lives intersected around a common experience or a common identity. And we cast a show that included me and four other survivors of child sexual abuse telling our stories and wove our stories together chronologically so that we could start to get at the collective nature of this harm. And we were all prison abolitionists um, by the time we were cast in the show. That was really important to me politically to start to look at the state violence aspect of this pandemic, really, uh, the pandemic of childhood rape. And we didn't have any trans women in the show. We had people of many other gender identities um, and sexual orientations, but no trans women. And towards the end of the whole project in 2012, I learned that American Academy of Pediatrics um, statistic, which showed that actually male assigned at birth children are up to six times likelier to be raped or sexually assaulted. Right. Uh, and that's the highest rate in terms of gender based violence. Male assigned at birth children who are gender nonconforming are actually the ones um, who are most likely to be targeted by sexual violence. And so if we had movements to end sexual violence that reflected that disproportionate nature of violence, our movements would be led by trans women of color, right? If they were intersectional, they would be led by Black and Indigenous and Latinx trans women. And if you think about some of the first forms of community care um, that I have been inspired by, it's really Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera's work. When they were leading street transvestite action revolutionaries, they pooled their income as sex workers and rented out an entire brownstone in New York City and let transgender children who were 
fleeing often child abuse in their homes, right? Transphobic child abuse, homophobic child abuse in their homes. Uh, Sylvia and Marcia wanted to spare these children from the burden that they had to endure. Sylvia Rivera was very open about the fact that she fled child sexual abuse when she was 14 and was homeless on the Christopher Street piers and traded her body so that she could have freedom from the violence in her family. And they pooled their income as sex workers to give transgender homeless children who they encountered a free place to live. Right. That is the roots of the anti-sexual violence movement that I want to be part of. And so Mirror Memoirs, the national organization that I co-lead uh, with my colleague Jaden Fields, started with an audio archive of LGBTQ people of color who survived child sexual abuse telling our stories. Alicia is actually one of our sacred storytellers. We have 60 recorded stories across 15 states. Um, and there's the slide, thank you. You can check out our social media. We will be releasing our archive in 2021. And we've also led many um, healing circles and uh, brought people together for political education webinars, somewhat like this one as well, um, both survivor only spaces and then including our accomplices who want to end rape culture. And we really think it's important that in our uh, programming, we center Black and Indigenous, transgender, and non-binary and gender non-conforming survivors of child sexual abuse. So please check out that work. We are unapologetically abolitionist and we do not receive state funding, so we're entirely funded um, by individuals and by foundations. So that's a little bit about the work I'm doing now, and Alicia is next. Yo, the chat right now is fire. Um, and so just um, feeling deep gratitude for all of the power in, um, in the chat box uh, during your conversation, Amitha. So thank you um, to the folks who are in conversation with us. Thank you, Amitha, for sharing your story. Y'all have me so hyped right now. I love you. Um, yeah, so what am I doing? How is my abolition praxis showing up in this space? Um, so I want to talk about um, my work and the work of Collective Action for Safe Spaces, um, who if I, I can put it in the chat box afterwards, but I am not a great multitasker, so I won't try to do it right now. Um, and so I came again, I came to this work after a long time of working in what we'd consider um, mainstream uh, gender-based violence movement spaces from local um, rape crisis and domestic violence shelter work to um, national um, sexual assault and domestic violence organizations from like research and um, policy and legislative advocacy around the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. Um, and all of that while I was still organizing against police violence and um, working as a member of Insight um, feminists of color against violence um, nationally and in Washington DC in particular. And so I was holding these dual roles of working in very mainstream, um, often white women led organizations that were deeply antagonistic um, and carceral and punitive, um, not only to the survivors that we were working with, but also to those of us who were um, folks of color um, on staff and, and certainly those of us who were survivors on staff. There was um, this underlying tension of being a survivor um, organization and also not feeling safe or um, able to, to talk about our own lived experience, even in passing without being pathologized. And so um, I came from holding both this like, you know, mainstream organization space and then also um, working in these alternative <laughs> models. Um, and so um, I got really interested in helping communities figure out ways to intervene in violence um, without having to use the police. And so some of the ways that that showed up was in prevention work. And so um, in many of our rape crisis centers, um, we did things like um, teach young folks about um, their bodies and bodily autonomy. We taught parents about um, how to recognize signs of violence while also holding the fact that for many of us, the violence was happening in our homes. Um, we taught teachers and other kinds of like folks who have interactions with children to make sure that they were um, paying attention to signs and um, symbols and um, 
the way that being a survivor shows up in childhood for, for some of us um, and trying to figure out ways to do that without using mandated reporting, without using child protective services, which overly targets um, Black and Indigenous folks um, who make up the large majority of children um, who are in foster care and um, youth detention. Um, I saw a study today that said there were more Native children in foster care today than there were during the time of boarding schools. And so that, that literally I saw today, so I couldn't even tell you where it was from, but I, it just really stands out to me um, around the fact that it is so necessary for us to find alternatives. So we were trying to figure that out. And all of this, um, I think in the words of Adrian Marie Brown, perhaps, is that it's all uh, science fiction, right? So this is exploratory. This is, um, we are um, trying to innovate. We're trying to iterate. We're trying to figure things out as we go. One of the other ways that that looked was by um, engaging in bystander intervention. And so training communities, training the public, training folks at libraries on public transportation um, in restaurants and bars about how to be bystanders when we see gendered violence or racialized violence in public spaces. And so again, the with the entire and explicit goal of giving communities the tools and the alternatives for engaging with each other and keeping each other safe without having to ever call the police, right? And that can happen in big and small ways. Sometimes it's like in Amita's story, having a neighbor who comes to check on you, right? Um, you Do you know your neighbors, right? So like making sure that you actually know your neighbors' names and so that you can be in deep community with one another. Um, so there's bystander intervention, there was primary prevention, and then the kind of the last thing I'll talk about is that in DC we are working to create a transformative justice incubator um, like the New York Transformative Justice Hub or the Bay Area Transform Transformative Justice Collective that um, is really focused on giving survivors, particularly those of us who are queer, trans, non-binary, um, and those of us of color, survivors of sexual violence and intimate partner violence who want alternatives to the police um, and alternatives to um, the criminal legal system in order to hold their abusers accountable. So what we're doing is we are um, building relationships. We are um, creating reading circles. Is that what they're called? I think they're called reading circles um, and listening circles. We are listening to survivors to hear what they want. We're listening to community members to hear what kind of tools they need in order to feel like we can actually hold space for survivors without having to engage um, in the police um, or the criminal legal system. I think that sometimes survivors are often pitted against um, calls for abolition. People say, well, what about the survivors who will protect us? And um, what we know as survivors of color is that the police have not kept us safe. And in fact, the state um, is an enactor of harm in many of our communities, both um, physical harm and sexual harm. The, the study or the statistic that I always like to share is that the second most reported form of police violence after excessive force is sexual assault. Um, and so that is the reality of policing and sexual violence for many of us. And so in all of these ways, we're trying to figure out how to keep ourselves safe and keep our communities safe without ever having to engage with the police because really we know um, that you are the first person that I call, right? Like that um, if violence happens in my family, I'm calling Amita first, right? I'm not calling the police first. And so we really wanna give each other the tools and the skills and the resources that we need, including housing, food, um, livable wages, care for our children, all of those things that we need to keep ourselves and each other safe. And so we have to be doing all of those things um, simultaneously. Thank you. And I'll pass it to Su Sujata. Thank you so much. I'm just um, feeling a lot of joy and excitement um, listening to this. Um, and just so grateful for all the different ways uh, that everyone is <clears throat> making efforts um, at this um, huge, huge undertaking that we are doing, right? Um, and so I'll say that um, my work really, like how do I live, how do I live and work um, 
an abolitionist politic today. So uh, sort of in the work side of things, most traditionally, there's sort of two things that I've done. Um, and it's about creating uh, restorative justice opportunities that circumvent the criminal legal system. So there's a lot of folks who do restorative justice um, that do it in tandem with um, or embedded with uh, the state. And then there are those who do it sort of external to. Um, and um, so my work has been uh, to the degree to which it is at all possible, uh, both working with young folks who've caused harm um, and also on the adult side uh, with intimate partner and sexual violence. Um, and I personally also occasionally facilitate uh, cases uh, in my community off the grid. We just got a call a couple days ago um, from a beloved person who is like, I'm not engaging the state and this is, this is what I need instead. And so I feel really grateful um, that, that this, in this tiny way that we're starting to build this muscle and this, and this possibility. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot more to be said about what that looks like, and we're very time limited, but um, this is this idea of creating uh, processes that exist entirely external to the state where there is true accountability, uh, and that it can operate at the community level. It is something that uh, when properly resourced to do so, communities and families can uh, resolve harm without any reliance on state intervention. Um, and so, uh, so you know, it, it less, my work is less about dismantling uh, what is wildly broken um, and more about it's sort of like if we've decided that certain fast food places are really unhealthy and everyone thinks that's the only place to eat, what does it look like on the way there uh, to have built a gorgeous community garden where there's a barbecue and there's good music and there's like, oh, let's stop here to eat instead, right? What does it mean for us to build within our communities and our families the capacity um, to uh, not lean away from, but lean into conflict and harm so that when really terrible things happen, that that trust in that container is there uh, in order for it to happen. Um, and the other piece that I would say that I do is uh, speaking publicly as a survivor against criminal, uh, increasing criminal penalties. Um, and so I'm often the only survivor. If people were just listening to my um, plenary, you're hearing a lot of the same things twice, so I'm very sorry about that. But I'm often the only survivor to testify. Um, and I was recently, a couple years ago, whenever that was, um, uh, the only uh, survivor to testify against ending the statute limitations. And, and there was something very powerful about that day. Earlier that day in Sacramento, I had been sitting in circle with a whole bunch of CSA survivors. Uh, and, and during that uh, 60 plus person workshop, countless people shared that the system never protected them and that it was a family member who did this to them and that, um, that they were never able to, even in that circle, they were afraid to name the person who perpetrated against them because they were afraid that they were making us all witnesses against each other. Uh, and that, you know, if the statute of limitations ended, um, that, uh, you know, talking in public spaces, writing a book about the abuse, this and that and the other, could be evidence against their brother, father, cousin, uncle, um, coach, imam, um, oh my goodness, the list went on and on. And so uh, for me, um, I, I live with the privilege and the pain of having had the person who harmed me, one of the people who harmed me, my father, um, it, having had, had, he's passed away. So I, I don't fear uh, his incarceration anymore, right? And so I have the privilege of being able to speak freely about what he's done without ever worrying that my public speaking would do this. And I I have zero judgment about who chooses to speak, even if it could be used against the person who harmed them, uh, or people who choose not to speak, uh, who, who, for whatever reasons, for whatever and whoever they are taking care of, including themselves. Um, but it, it was just extremely powerful to me uh, to know that while there were countless people lined up to speak for uh, ending the statute of limitations, I was sitting there knowing that there were these 60 survivors uh, who didn't want it and, and who couldn't say. And so um, the degree to which I can continue to do that. And I just think finally, uh, the piece around um, living into this uh, world in which uh, there are no prisons. Um, it has been about acknowledging, you know, I love this Audre Lorde quote, you hear it all the time, the master's house uh, can't be dismantled by the master's tools, right? Um, but what I've learned in trying to bring restorative justice uh, to 
um, communities and families and, and try walking with people who are interested in grappling with this is that, you know, it's not going to be the master that dismantles his own house with indigenous people's tools, right? Um, and so to that end, if we want restorative justice to operate at its best, it really needs to be uh, off the grid and at a minimum, fully circumventing uh, the criminal legal system. And so uh, that is the work that I do. Um, and then finally, I would say that living into it also, um, and I already said this in my plenary too, is that uh, it means about excavating uh, the police in my heart. Uh, when is it that I am um, uh, policing myself and others? Um, and what does it mean uh, to abolish the police uh, within my heart and soul? So um, so that is, is what I would say. And then um, we're going to move into the next part. Uh, which is um, about uh, giving you all just a moment in this uh, in this in this workshop. We're going to go just a few minutes over, um, but we want to just give you all a moment. Again, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of juicy stuff happening in the chat. I'm looking at um, to take a breath and um, to contemplate uh, and maybe take some notes on write um, down some similar questions uh, to what it is that the, the three of us just answered, right? And, and so the, the variation on that is, um, what brought you to this workshop? Uh, and as you engage in that question, and you think about that, don't forget to breathe if that feels good for you, or even put your hand on your belly maybe. Uh, to just ground yourself in your body, maybe you feel the feet on the floor, and you ask yourself, what brought you to this workshop? And I would also ask you uh, to ask yourself um, how you might live into an abolitionist politic. And this is something I recently learned from the Compassion Institute, uh, that there's a sort of this uh, interlap, overlapping circles. Uh, the inner zone is the comfort zone, and then outside of that is your growth zone, and beyond that is the overwhelm zone. So when you're answering these kinds of questions, sometimes it's good to push ourselves a little bit outside that comfort zone uh, into the growth zone, um, but there might be things you can do from right inside that comfort zone too, to lean in uh, to um, how you might live into your abolitionist politic. And so, or for those who are just uh, checking it out today for the first time, just starting to think through these things, um, how you might simply learn more uh, while going into your growth zone. So um, you could put that in the chat or you could just keep that to yourself and think about it as questions for the future. You know, why, why did you sign up for this workshop? What brought you here? And, um, and just to really honor that, honor that curiosity, honor that commitment, um, and, um, and how might you live into it more? Uh, so uh, I think I pass it on now to Alicia. Sorry, I was um, also typing in the chat and I told you my, um, uh, <laughs> my skills of multitasking are getting um, harder and harder in these moments. Thank you, um, Sujatha, um, for giving us some space to breathe and um, an opportunity for folks to talk about um, where they, how they got here, um, what brought them into this space, which I feel really grateful um, for. Um, so I know that we want to give folks um, a little space to answer, ask some questions. I know that folks have already asked some questions in the chat box. Um, and so I just want to lift out a couple of them. I'm not going to say people's names um, just for privacy reasons, but um, I, I'm just going to lift up a couple of questions. And any of us, um, Sujata, Amita, or myself, um, might want to answer them. Um, so, so the first question is, um, is it appropriate for the state to have a role in providing funding to organizations who are doing abolition work, transformative justice, restorative justice work. Um, 
they ask with huge increases in victim services funding in the last few years, could this be an appropriate funding source um, to support the work or does that need to be, does there need to be a separation really between the state and the work? So that's, that's the first question. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll stop there and give you a chance, folks, a chance to answer. I, I do have some thoughts on this. Um, but I don't want to cut anybody off if Amita, you wanted to, or Alicia, I feel, I'll just, I'll jump in really quick, which is that I think that it, it requires um, a deep conversation. And I've worked with organizations recently. So historically, um, restorative justice has not been funded by the state. It was sort of lumped in with mediation, which was considered uh, an inappropriate thing to do. Um, for sexual and intimate partner violence, and that people actually felt that they were putting their organization's funding at risk for doing uh, restorative justice um, if they were VAWA funded. Um, and um, there has more recently been some changes uh, in funding uh, across the board where there's an opening to restorative justice. So the question is, uh, and this is something that, you know, we worked very deeply with when I was at the, um, at the restorative justice project at Impact Justice, uh, what kinds of real conversations are you going to have to have about whether or not you're willing to walk away from funding if the funding requires certain things from you? Do you have to report information back to the state? Do you have to operate in tandem with the state? Do you have to, and can you um, say, I'm not ever going to do that stuff. Um, I'm happy to take your funding. Um, but if you, um, if you, you know, if you want to operate in relationship to us, we are circumventing your system entirely and we are not ferreting information back to you. We are not your um, investigators. We are not your right. And to have the kind of, um, there are some jurisdictions in this nation that are starting to acknowledge that uh, the criminal legal system has failed on a certain number of fronts, right? And there's some progressive prosecutors um, is this term that is being thrown around. So in those spaces, right, funding is, is starting to flow, right? So can that can that genuinely happen? Will people genuinely say, I will walk away from this job, I will walk away from, that is a deep and powerful question that needs to be asked. On the other hand, in the same way that the state pays for roads to be paved, et cetera, um, our safety is in theory um, something that should be supported, right? And so can that happen? I think we're at the beginning of an experiment. Um, I'm not always optimistic about that. I think we have to be very, very careful and very explicit um, and have things in writing um, about where our line is drawn, right? Um, so that is my feeling. And I welcome people saying, absolutely not. There's no way you can take state funding and not be beholden to the state or be operating in tandem with the state. Um, that's, and it's a learning edge for me. And, and again, I feel like we're very much at the beginning of an experiment. So I will stop there. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Sujata. I don't know, Amita, if you have more to add um, to that. And I also invite other folks um, to ask questions in the chat box, and we'll try to answer those as well. Um, I, I, sorry, I was trying to listen to Sujata and look at the chat box at the same really? time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I also offered a question in the chat box, um, which comes from the Mirror Memoirs interviews, and I, I see some folks saying that it's useful, so I will just offer that. This is a question I return to a lot when I feel challenged around um, how the nonprofit industrial complex has been working traditionally around traditionally in the last couple decades um, around work to end sexual violence. Uh, in the Mirror Memoirs audio archive, I asked everybody, and that's 60 different interviewees, if you went through a portal into another dimension in which capitalism does not exist, and your only responsibility while you're there from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep is to heal yourself, and you have a bottomless toolbox with every spiritual and material resource you need to support your healing, what's in the box. And I, I will just share that what was really powerful for me in that interview process was that no one said an expansion of the carceral state, right? People named things like, you know, 
if you watched the keynote from today, uh, Farah Tanis spoke about the fact that Black Women's Blueprint has just purchased 300 acres of land in upstate New York. That is ending sexual violence work. And that's very much in line with what many survivors within Mirror Memoirs are calling for, a place to be in right relationship with the land, a place to return to our nurturing of the earth and of ourselves and of one another, uh, a place to have intimacy with one another, right? Because the act of sexual violence is an act of division. It's an act of violate, uh, isolation. And so part of healing, at least as I understand it, is in learning how to create connection. And that can happen when we have um, land and freedom. And so I invite you to play with that question if it's helpful to you to wrap your head around like, okay, once we divest from the state, what are we fighting for? What do we think survivors actually want? And asking yourself that question too. Alicia, back to you. Thanks. I feel like a newscaster. Back to me. Um, Amita, your question just reminded me of something that I wrote in um, the book Love with Accountability, which is like sitting literally right here, um, by Aisha Shaida Simmons um, and is a Lambda Award book winner. Um, Love with Accountability, Digging Up the Roots of Sexual Violence, which includes the stories of maybe 50 um, Black survivors of child sexual abuse. Um, and to answer your question, I just really want to read this um, like piece of, my, um, of what I said in the book, which is that I dream of a place where families have conversations about consent boundaries before abuse happens. I have a vision where parents and teachers have paid sick leave, living wages, and time to be attuned to their children's and students' needs and behaviors a place where families aren't ripped apart through deportations, policing, and the prison industrial complex, a place where the protection of children is community-led and not institutionalized, where child safety, health, and well-being are not placed solely on the shoulders of women and femmes. Um, networks of care for our children and for the adults who have survived, like ourselves, means creating community-based prevention and responses to violence, responses that do not engage in punitive justice, but hold the folks who've done us harm accountable and keep survivors safe. These things allow us to wrestle with dichotomies of good and bad and the various complexities and nuances of the communities with whom we are a part. We, you and I, are often the first people to whom child sexual abuse survivors go when they share their experience, whether as children or as adults, um, being, uh, prepared and being believed, right, being prepared for crisis and utilizing all of our resources in a coordinated and safe way can help survivors feel seen, heard, and protect children who have yet to come. In our networks of care, violence prevention will not happen through dependence on policing, but through divestment in any system that seeks to dominate, coerce, or control our communities. Recently, I watched a video of fire ants in action. Just go with me here. Um, fire ants work together in such a closely coordinated way that when in danger, they can become moving, protected, semi-solid structures. I'm kind of obsessed with um, fire ants as long as they're nowhere near me. Um, yet when a barrier falls in their way, like a tree branch, they're able to navigate around the barrier in a way that behaves almost like water. What if all of our networks of care could be like fire ants? solid and coordinated, but adaptable and responsive to need, centered on safety, rehabilitation, accountability, and healing. Creating communities where child sexual abuse is not just no longer tolerated, but also eradicated. Where those of us who have survived are not the ones left to pick up the pieces of our shame alone, but are met with the chorus of we believe you and it's not your fault. When people recognize that when violence happens, the whole community needs healing. So that's just a part of it, but just reminded me so deeply of um, our work together in Mirror Memoirs, um, Amita, and being able to share what a vision looks like for, um, for alternatives to, to the world that we're currently in. So let's see if there are other questions here. Um, um, what is the role now for folks in the legal field to also work as abolitionists? As a, as a recovering lawyer, I have an answer for this. Um, and um, I'm excited to say that the um, 
NACDL, so the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, um, is actually engaging with this question um, October 19th. I should know this because I'm speaking on that panel. Um, and, um, you know, really leaning into what does it look like to both be operating within systems and be operating from an abolitionist perspective. It is a deeply challenging thing. I'm deeply grateful to, I think I may have mentioned her already today, Susan Marcus, who's actually the first person who said the words restorative justice to me um, for bringing together this panel of uh, practitioners um, and others who are thinking about what does it mean to actually straight up name the fact that the criminal legal system is fundamentally broken um, uh, and, to, and to speak from an abolitionist place in courts. Um, to to name all of this and so it is it's tricky right um but i think that there's there's much that can be done um i myself am someone who believes that um that we need to be very very thoughtful about how our legal strategies undermine the end goal of ending mass criminalization and we see this all the time as lawyers that people will take on some piece of something and do some very incremental reform um, that that actually undermines the notion that the entire thing is fundamentally broken, right? So I think that uh, that that criminal defense lawyers, um, prison, um, uh, you know, prisoners' rights uh, activists and lawyers, all of us need to be thinking very deeply about what does it mean um, to employ strategies that don't undermine the end goal. Um, and that where incremental change and small reforms are actually working to reify and maintain a system uh, that they need to be abandoned and that we have to be in deep, deep dialogue with community organizers and um, abolitionists who will have very, very challenging things to say to us about the things that we're trying to do um, that seem to be helping some small handful of people. Right. If it's not helping, if, if it's actively setting us back for some of us, uh, it's insufficient. And the thing um, that and, and it's actually it's damaging the end goal. So I will just say that uh, it's a it's a much more complex question that can be answered in the time we have allotted. And I know that we're bumping up on time, um, but I want to give other people a chance to answer that question if, if that feels useful. Thank you, Sujata, and thank you for the question. I'll just add that um, I'm thinking a lot about like no drop rules or pro prosecution policies. I think that what often happens in our legal system is that um, policies are created for some survivors but end up harming um, those of us who and those who are the most marginalized um, survivors. So again, like in no drop or pro um, pro prosecution policies, they actually were created in order in their mind to protect survivors from um, uh, their experiences and stories and the violence that they were experiencing not being taken seriously. Um, and yet the kind of unintended or consequence of that, um, of those kinds of no drop policies were that um, prosecutors could go through with um, uh, a, a trial without a survivor's consent. And so I think that given the dynamics of, you know, gendered violence and domestic violence and sexual violence there, and the risk of um, the risk of violence when leaving, you know, we know that survivors are making rational choices about safety and about how to engage with these kinds of systems. And so the state continuing to prosecute without a survivor's consent in the name of um, maybe public safety often proves what those of us who are prison abolitionists know, which is that um, prosecution is, the, is to the benefit of the state. The state actually sees themselves as the victim and not to the benefit of the survivor. And is often um, the survivor has no choice in the kind of justice or the way that that um, justice looks um, or, or how that is framed. And so I think that, yeah, we have to just be really thoughtful and careful about the way that our legal processes um, actually scaffold and uphold systems of violence that end up harming not just the survivor survivors themselves, but our entire, um, our entire communities. Other questions? I don't know how much time we have. Someone will stop me, I suppose. <laughs> uh, this is Amita. My voice is just here without a screen to let you know that Meghna said just to let her know when we are ready to wrap up. And I do want to name that we are, I think, 15 minutes over time already. Oh, 
Good show. Well, um, then I just want to maybe, I think maybe now makes sense to wrap up. Um, There's some really good questions in the chat box. And I know that Amita, Sujata, and I talked before this about like wanting to remain in the community with you. And so I think that you have our like contact information and all of that good stuff. I will turn it back over to Amita to kind of close us out of this space, but just want to have a moment, another moment of gratitude to all of you um, and um, say that we are so deeply honored and excited and grateful to be in relationship with all of you here today. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Sujata. I want to thank um, our ASL interpreters for making this space accessible and possible. Um, we didn't talk enough because we were so pressed for time around the intersectional approach that is needed for abolition that really centers people who are all at once Black, transgender, and disabled. But I think it is very important to know, and I invite you all, if you don't um, know much about the intersection between specifically child sexual abuse and disability, um, to look at uh, the work of um, Aaron, uh, Liam Esposito, uh, who does a lot of work on this issue, particularly in the deaf community, um, and then Talila T.L. Lewis, uh, who is also a leader in supporting um, Black deaf people who are incarcerated. Uh, there's much for all of us to learn, and I say that as a hearing person. So really genuine, deep thank you to our ASL interpreters for making this conversation more accessible. And I want to thank each and every one of you for giving us the extra time. I see that there's still over 150 people in the chat, um, and so thank you so much for being with us through the end. Um, this is the beginning of a collective exploration, right? As Pharaoh Tanis was saying during the keynote, the revolution is not here yet, but it's coming. And part of our work individually as survivors is to envision what is our personal vision for a world without sexual violence? What is our personal vision for a world in which healing and justice do not rely on the violence of the state? Um, I want to invite you all to do that breath with me one more time before we close out, because I know that many of us are going into other Zoom situations today. I also want to invite you to hydrate, get outside if you can, if that's accessible to you, and stare at the sun, uh, not directly at it, but let the sunlight hit your eyes, um, because that helps reset our nervous system too. Zoom is a lot, um, and it's not really how we're meant to be coming together for the long run. So. In that spirit, if you will join me again, two inhalations and one exhalation, and we're going to do three of those. Here we go. That's one. That's two. And that's three. Continue to take care of yourselves and each other. And thank you again for joining us.